Silicon Valley, 1979. Steve Jobs has a hit on his hands with the Apple II. In just two and a half years, the company has sold more than 40,000 units nationwide, and revenues top $45 million. Inside the company's Cupertino offices, engineers have begun developing the Apple III. But Steve Jobs is distracted by the innovative work of a rival company. He went to Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and saw the development work that Xerox had been spending you know, large amounts of money for many years developing the first graphic-based computers. Jobs negotiates a deal. Xerox purchases $1 million in Apple stock. In exchange, Xerox gives Jobs a demonstration of its crown jewel, the Alto computer. Once you have a computer like this, it's like you've got the most powerful computer in the world. You never go back. The Alto employs a radically new concept, visually rich, graphics-based interface based on a virtual desktop, Windows, and a mouse. It's the way most people interact with computers today. Steve's idea was we are the personal computer company. We wanted to see this technology and then make it in a version for the masses. The Lisa was really where Apple wanted to make its mark and make the machines radically easier to use. Jobs slaves over every detail of the Lisa and soon the computer is far behind schedule. Apple will spend $50 million developing it, but money at this time is not a problem. In December 1980, Apple goes public in the biggest initial public offering since Ford Motor Company in 1956. And Steve Jobs becomes a Silicon Valley celebrity and a millionaire hundreds of times over. But even wealth beyond his wildest dreams can't quell his reputation as a hothead. Steve is famous for being scary. And um, there's a lot of people have stories about Steve in their face, nose to nose, screaming. The Apple board of directors understands that Jobs is the heart and soul of Apple but they believe he's too young and volatile to run a publicly traded company. After the IPO, Jobs is given the largely ceremonial title of chairman and is pulled from the Lisa project. Steve was free to go off and design anything he wanted, do anything he wanted at Apple. He just couldn't participate in the real operating group of the Lisa computer. With the Lisa off limits, Jobs turns his attention to a small research unit within Apple that has built a new prototype for an all-in-one graphics-based computer called the Macintosh. Jobs wants control of the Mac group, and the board is more than happy to oblige. For now, Jobs is back to doing what he does best, leading a group of renegades toward a computing breakthrough. If you went to the Mac building when it was a pirate flag that flew on the flagpole on the roof, because they were very competitive with Lisa and the Apple II. Despite Jobs' us-against-the-world mentality, the press continues to paint him as a brilliant young entrepreneur. In 1982, Jobs cooperates with Time Magazine reporter Mike Moritz for a cover story. Moritz was an excellent reporter, and he found many unflattering things about Steve Jobs. He kind of uncovered the dark side of Steve Jobs' personality, including the fact that Jobs had fathered a daughter out of wedlock, and Jobs was refusing to acknowledge that he was the father of this child. And they portrayed him as this crazy, out of control, tyrannical nutcase, and he got so burned by that 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 was sort of the last time that he invited in the press behind the scenes. By 1983, Apple has far bigger problems than a bit of bad press. In January, Apple finally introduces the Lisa. With a $10,000 price tag, it's an unequivocal flop. And even Jobs, who poured so much time and money into its development, finds it tough to appear positive. Is this the ultimate office computer? Today? To make matters worse, tech giant IBM overtakes Apple in the personal computer market, despite the rival company's late entry into the game. In light of these missteps, the Apple board dispatches Jobs to find an experienced executive to run the company. After dozens of interviews, Jobs meets with Pepsi CEO John Scully. I said, Steve, I'm not going to come to Apple. I'm going to stay at Pepsi. And he looked down at his running shoes and paused for about 15 seconds and looked up at me. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? To Scully, innovation sounds more exciting than corn syrup. A few months later, he signs on as president of Apple Computer. The company's stock price soars. As the release date for the Macintosh rapidly approaches, Jobs never compromises his vision. He drives his team harder and harder. I remember one of the engineers was working on what was called the Macintosh Finder, and he'd been working for probably 36 hours straight. Comes in, hands Steve the latest version of the Finder, and he said, I think I've got it this time. And Steve said, is it the best work you can do? He said, well, 
it may not be the best, but I really am proud of this. He said, I don't care, throw it back at him. He said, go do it again and bring it back when it's the best you can do. In October 1983, a brazen Jobs takes the stage at a meeting of Apple's sales staffers and mocks his biggest competitor. IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry, the entire information age? Was George Orwell right? The lights dim, and Jobs plays a $1.5 million Macintosh television commercial made by feature film director Ridley Scott. We shall prevail. 1984 airs only once during Super Bowl 18, but it wins critical acclaim and plenty of buzz for Apple's latest product. That groundbreaking 1984 ad, probably the most famous ad in TV history. Two days after the commercial airs, at Apple's shareholder meeting at De Anza College, Jobs waits backstage. On the other side of the curtain, hundreds take their seats. It's time to unveil the Macintosh, and Steve Jobs' reputation hangs in the balance. He's standing backstage, and I'm the only person with him, and he is white as a sheet. His hands are shaking, and he said, this is... Uh, the scariest thing I've ever done. He said, I'm so nervous. The minute Steve walked out on the stage, he was transformed. I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. He had perfect poise, perfect timing. It was one of the most memorable Steve Jobs performance you've ever seen. Hello, I'm Macintosh. The truth is great to get out of that bag. In 1984, we had a terrific year. The Mac got off to a tremendous success. It was well positioned and Steve and I got along great. But Jobs' bravado can't sway consumers beyond the initial fanfare. In 1985, the sales of the Macintosh started to fall off. The critics were now saying, it's not innovative, it's a toy. It'll never be as taken seriously. With hindsight, you know, you could say we had an incomplete product. <laughs> there wasn't too much software. And so, you know, without software, what do you do with a personal computer? Jobs and Scully clash over the company's future. Scully wants to funnel resources into the Apple II in order to extend its life. Jobs strongly disagrees. He felt that was looking backwards, not looking forwards. And so we had a serious fallout. Tension between Scully and Jobs boils over, and Scully gives the board an ultimatum. It's either him or Jobs. The board chooses Scully and removes Jobs from the Macintosh division. So what the board wanted Steve to do was go off and create the next thing after Macintosh. He stayed on as chairman, and then he eventually went off and resigned. Scully and Jobs haven't spoken since. But for Scully, the passage of time may have put things in perspective. Looking back, it probably didn't make sense to push out the founder who was the visionary and knew how to build the products. And here I am, the out there, knowing nothing prior to joining Apple about computers. More than 20 years later, the wound still seems fresh. At his 2005 Stanford commencement speech, Jobs claims he was fired from Apple. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started?